we pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you touch your heart this day through your word, that you show us once again the importance of living for you and for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, how many of you guys have lied today? There's Pinocchio there. Hey, I hope you guys have lied today. That's good to hear that. Uh, I saw a study this week that was done in England about men and women, and guess who lie more often? So who thinks that women lie more often? Raise your hand, okay? Men. Who thinks that men lie more often? Well, in this study, they are watching men and women, and for every six lies that the men told, women told two. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So surprising, isn't it, all of you? Yeah. Okay, the men are bigger liars than women. And men and women, though, have one thing in common in that the number one lie that men and women told were the exact same lie. And the lie was this. People ask you, how are you doing? And the lie is, oh, I'm fine. And think about how often you have told that lie. How are you doing? I'm fine. When really, in reality, you are not fine. You are torn apart inside. You are sad. You are going through some struggles. And yet, this is your answer. Oh, I'm fine. And guess where this lie is told most often? Anybody guess where? Church. In church. That's right. You come here to church, you put on your happy face, and you tell everybody that you are fine when you're really not. And where do you think the safest place is not to be fine should be? It should be in church. Here you can say, I am not fine. I am hurting today. And allow people to minister to you and to pray for you and to care for you. So when you are not fine, it's okay not to be fine here in church. Uh, there's a new Christian song about how we come to church to be broken together. We are to be broken here together, caring for each other and our hurts and our pains and our sufferings. So lying is all around us. If you lie and I lie, we all lie, but then there's the biggest liar of all. And so if you can't take out your sermon notes for today, they're in the middle of your bulletin. And the biggest liar is the devil, Satan. Point number one. It says, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And we're doing this sermon series on lies of Satan. And we looked at three different lies so far. The first one, YOLO, you only live once, and that is a lie. You will live again. On Friday, I was doing a funeral. The hope from that funeral is that the loved one will live again. Myth number two, all roads lead to the one God. And Jesus says, no, he is the only way to the Father. And then myth number three, all you need is love. But well, you need more than love. You need faith and hope in Jesus Christ. So those are the lies we've looked at so far. Today's lie is we are living in a material world. And that we're just to focus on getting more and more stuff. And yet contentment, real contentment, is found in another place. And I want to play you this really beautiful little uh, video about contentment right now. I found this on the internet. But how often we are like that, aren't we? We complain and moan, and we keep chasing after more and more stuff, thinking that stuff is going to make us happy. So look at part two of your sermon notes, that we focus our lives on getting more and more and more to be content, and so we buy and buy and buy and become unhappy when we don't buy all that we want. And so here is the lie that things bring happiness. And here is the truth the Bible brings us. Loving relationships bring happiness. Invest in loving God, loving others, and serving the world. And this way of thinking has been around for a long, long time, thinking that stuff brings happiness. Uh, there's this famous quote here from a Russian author. Who here can say his last name? Dostoevsky. That's right. You all read him in high school, didn't you? Yeah. And this is from the brothers... Very good. So look what he said. This is what he said. The world says you have needs. Satisfy them. You have as much right as the rich and the mighty. Don't hesitate to satisfy your needs. Indeed, expand your needs and demand more. This is the worldly doctrine of today. 
And they believe that this is freedom. The result for the rich is isolation and suicide. For the poor, envy and murder. And a lot of you are thinking, if I just had a bit more money, then I would be content. If I was just a millionaire, I would just be so happy. And so I read a study about the top 10% in our nation. And they are full of worry themselves. Uh, of the, all the millionaires here, 48% of them worry about having enough money for retirement, even though they're millionaires. 59% uh, worry about their health. Another 85% worry about being sued pretty much every day. 75% of them worry about identity theft. They worry about protecting their assets. They worry about their businesses. They worry a lot about their children and how they're being messed up by their wealth. And they worry about keeping up with the Joneses. Do they have the right car and the big enough house? Are they taking vacations in the right spot? And so even the wealthy can get caught up with the bye, 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 bye concept. And this is what all of us here need to fight constantly. And so the Bible teaches that contentment does not come from our stuff. It comes from an inner attitude. And it begins with what is called the second birth, being born again through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, we all need a Copernicum revolution. And who knows what the Copernicum revolution was? It was a revolution in how we viewed the world. Before Copernicum brought out his idea, most people thought that the world was the center of what? Yeah. The universe. And that everything revolved around our world. And then Capernaum showed us that, no, we are not the center of the universe. We're way off on the side of a really, really big universe. And when all of you were born as little babies, you thought that you were the center of the universe. And have some of you ever grown out of that? No. Some of you still think that you're the center of the universe. And the new birth begins with humility, of confessing to God that you are not the center of the universe. That you are, what we say in the Luther faith, a poor, miserable sinner in need of God's grace and God's mercy. And that God calls you to ask for his mercy and to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And with that new birth, you begin to look at life a little bit differently. That life isn't about buying stuff until it's over, bye-bye. That life is about relationships. A living relationship with God and loving relationships with other human beings. And you begin to say, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? And this is the danger of uh, your TVs and these all the TV churches. And the TV pastors might be doing a wonderful job at teaching. You can learn some good stuff. But what is missing when all you do is go to church in front of a TV? Those relationships, isn't it? You are not here to love so-and-so at the end of your pew who's not having a good day. You are not here to minister to children or to pray for the poor or to bring the good news of Jesus. And so the Christian faith is teaching you that we don't just live in a material world. We live in a world where real joy is found in relationships in loving God. And so this brings us to our Bible readings. It's from the book of 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy, and the book of 1 Timothy was written to a guy named what? <laughs> Timothy. And Timothy was a young pastor who lived 2,000 years ago, and this older pastor named Paul was his mentor. And Timothy was now running a little church, and he said, Mentor Paul, you started this church, what should I know to keep this church going well? And so look what Paul said to this young pastor named Timothy. Part number two, and read that with me. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And so the second birth teaches us contentment. That contentment will never be found in our stuff. Contentment is only found in loving relationships. Under part A, there's this little quote. Many a millionaire, after choking his soul with gold dust, has died from sadness. So look at point number one there. This is what this sermon's all about. And read that with me. Happiness always comes from personal relationships. Let me read that again. 
Happiness always comes from personal relationships. All the things in this world will never take the place of love, of personal relationships with other people. And so Christians have learned that great secret, that relationships are what life is all about. And so they work on relationships, loving other people, inviting other people to their house, being involved in other people's lives, and then coming to worship and being involved in a loving relationship with God. And so we need to escape from the trap of the lie of Satan that stuff makes us happy. Stuff is just stuff. It is people that bring us joy. And so under a number B, here's your spring Bible challenge uh, to get closer to God. And we want you all for the next couple weeks to read the Gospel of Mark. To daily do your prayers with God, your acts prayers, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. To be active in worship. And then acts of kindness. Just go around doing random acts of kindness. This is where contentment and joy is found in these loving relationships. And then it's having the right relationship with your money. So let's see what Paul says next to Timothy. And read that with me. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And now's the time for you guys to grab a Bible. We'd like you to bring your own Bible to church, but if you didn't bring one, uh, they're scattered all about. And open up to Exodus chapter 32. Okay, we are a church that really, really believes that you should be reading and knowing and studying the Word of God in the Bible. And Exodus chapter 32 takes place after God's people have left Egypt. They were slaves. God has delivered them with the ten plagues. They've gone to the Red Sea. The sea has opened. And now they have walked to Mount Sinai. And Moses is now on top of a mountain. And what is Moses doing on the mountain? He is getting what? Yeah, the Ten Commandments. So Moses is up there. And when the people of Israel left Egypt, a lot of them brought gold and silver with them that the Egyptians gave them to get them out of town. So this gold and the silver is neutral. What are they going to do with it, though? Look at Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, that's Moses' brother, and said, Come, make us gods with, who will go before us. As this fellow Moses has brought us out of Egypt, and we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. And so all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took what they handed him and made into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Fasten it with a tool, they said. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And so money is not good or bad. It's what we do with our money that can be good or bad. The children of Israel could have taken their money and fed the poor or uh, made a highway to Israel a little bit better. But instead they made their money into an idol. And this is our danger of us making our money into our idol. That our lives revolve around all of our stuff and not around people. I like this next quote in your uh, sermon notes, that the desire for money tends to be a thirst which is insatiable. Wealth is like seawater, so far from quenching a man's thirst. The more a man drinks of seawater, the more he wants to drink. The strange thing about wealth is that there never seems to come a time when we have enough. And so we come here to worship, to understand that life isn't about buying. It's about serving the right master. And that contentment comes in loving God and loving other people. And so Paul talks about condemning people who have the wrong way of thinking. And so if you look under number B, it says, Poor and discontent, condemnation. Rich and discontent, condemnation. Poor and content, no condemnation. Rich and content. More, no condemnation. 
And so money is not the problem. It's loving money, putting money first. Money is just a tool to bless other people. And so I pray that you will use your money as a tool to bless other people. When you walk up here to church, you saw our really neat preschool building over there. And uh, we built that building with gifts from the congregation and a little bit of a loan also. And that building has been a blessing to so many children in this community. And those who gave their money towards that building, do they still have their money? Well, yes and no. They don't have it in their hands, but their money is still there being used by God to bless other people. And so we have this antidote to materialism. We focus on permanent values. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And so this is what Paul wants that young pastor to know. It's about loving God and loving others and serving the world. And so this means we have to think outside the box that our world has placed us in. So what do we do with today's sermon? Now go down to point number four. And again, here's what Timothy was told by Paul. Let's read that together. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. And so we all have these little boxes we live in, boxes of friends, and our box of our job, and boxes of our money. We get so trapped inside these boxes. And in your sermon notes, you'll see uh, some little dots there. Every see those little dots, there's nine of them. Hey, can you connect those nine dots with three straight lines? Hmm, what? Three. Three lines. Can you connect those dots with three lines? Okay, Katie used four, I think. You two? Okay, there's three. There is a way to connect the dots, but you have to think outside the box. So this is how you connect the dots. This is one way. But you have to think outside the box to make the dots connect with three straight lines. And so you come to church to have a different way of thinking. You're thinking outside the box here in worship, aren't you? That life isn't just about stuff. Life is about my soul. Life is about God. Life is about the people around me. And Jesus wants you to have that born-again experience that you might see life differently. And then invest in those things that matter. So where you invest your love, you invest your life. And so God wants to encourage you to invest your love into people, not into stuff. Uh, Paul goes on to say to Timothy, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus invested his life into your life. He shed his blood to cover your sins. And in your sermon notes, at the very bottom of D, there's a Bible verse from the book of Hebrews. And it says, so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make people holy through his own blood. And so I hope that you view yourselves, one who has been made holy by the blood of Jesus. God got outside the box. Here's a holy God and us sinful people. How can God make us holy like he is holy? He can make us holy by coming to earth and suffering and dying and paying for our sins. To make us new people in Christ with new priorities and new ways of thinking. And so you're going to meet a lot of people who think that life is about using people and loving things. But what we have learned about life, life is about loving people and using things. Loving God and using things to his glory. And we then are brought to contentment as we lay our sins 
at the foot of the cross and believe in this God who loves us. So let us pray. Lord God, this week, this world is going to try to put us into a box once again to bombard us over and over again. That stop will bring us happiness. Help us to live outside that box, to live lives of faith and love, to invest our lives in loving people and in loving God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.